All right. So good afternoon, good evening, or even good morning, depending on wherever you're joining us from. A very warm welcome on behalf of FAU's International, law, uh, International Criminal Law Research Unit. My name is Julia Klaus. I'm a PhD candidate and research associate at this unit and will be your host and moderator today. I hesitate to say that it is my pleasure because I sincerely wish that the events that prompted us to organize this panel had never happened. More than two and a half months ago, Vladimir Putin ordered his troops to launch a wholesale invasion of the territory of Russia's neighbor state, Ukraine. By this blatant act of aggression that undoubtedly and undeniably violates the prohibition of force enshrined in the United Nations Charter, Putin escalated an assault on Ukrainian sovereignty that he had already begun in 2014. Above and beyond attacking the Ukrainian people, the Russian president's move is widely interpreted as an attack against the West, or more broadly, a Western-centric unipolar world order. On a side note, it remains disputed who actually belongs to that West and by whom, if any, that West is being led. It's not Germany at the moment, that's for sure. In an attempt to justify that invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin himself and members of his inner circle, like Dmitry Medvedev, both of whom once upon a time obtained law degrees, by the way, repeatedly used international law rhetoric. I deliberately said rhetoric because claims of a humanitarian intervention to stop an alleged genocide of the Russian-speaking population in eastern Ukraine apparently have no factual basis whatsoever. Aside from such unsubstantiated usage of international law vocabulary, however, there seems to be a number of Russian scholars who readily provide their government with slightly more sophisticated arguments against a universalist understanding of international law. Quite famously, Lauri Melkso in his 2014 volume, Russian Approaches to International Law from an External Point of View, also makes the case that there are particular national approaches to the international legal system as a whole and individual rules contained therein. Many of us are familiar with, let's say, different theoretical approaches to international law. You will surely have heard of constitutionalist approaches, feminist approaches, Marxist approaches, and so-called third world approaches to international law. It is disputed whether next to these various theoretical approaches, there are also diverging national approaches to international law. Acknowledging their existence would certainly conflict with universalist ideas of there being one international law for all. Not only Russia's or rather Russian officials rhetoric around the war in Ukraine has revived that debate. There are two other major global players that did not join the overwhelming pushback against Putin, China and India. Both countries have populations of more than 1 billion, significant weight in the global economy and are nuclear powers. China also possesses a veto right in the UN Security Council. Statements made by Chinese and Indian officials, but also blog posts and short articles written by Chinese and Indian scholars since 24 February, raise the question whether Ukraine is a scene not only of physical warfare, but also intellectual lawfare, as one might call it. So is Ukraine a collision point of diverging approaches to international law? I shall leave it at that at the moment and introduce our distinguished panelists with whom we will address that question today. I welcome as our first speaker, Dr. Yulia Miklasova. She is a postdoctoral researcher at the Academy for European Human Rights Protection at the University of Cologne. Yulia obtained her PhD from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. In her doctoral thesis, she examined secession in contemporary international law with a special reference to the post-Soviet space. Yulia had previously completed a two years master's program in international law at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, where she focused on the case of Transnistria and secession. 
Julia is originally from Slovakia, where she obtained inter alia two undergraduate degrees, one in law and one in Russian and Eastern European studies from Comenius University in Bratislava. Notable professional positions in her career were at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna, at the Global Migration Center, at the Graduate Institute in Geneva, and as a legal assistant to a member of the International Law Commission. Last but not least, she also represented the Slovak presidency of the European Union during expert meetings relating to the ESPO convention in Brussels and Geneva. So thank you for being with us, Julia. Our next speaker is Dr. Binxin Zhang. She's a PhD scholar in political science at the Centre de Recherche Internationale at Sciences Po in Paris. Prior to starting this PhD in 2019, she was Assistant Professor of Public International Law at Xiamen University in Southern China. In this capacity, she spent terms as visiting scholar at National Taiwan University, the Australian National University and Sciences Po. Binxin previously worked as legal officer in the International Committee of the Red Cross Regional Delegation for East Asia and as a trial monitor with the Asia International Justice Initiative. She holds a PhD in international law from Beijing's Renmin University of China. Notably, Binxin is a core expert on the Wu Mera Manual on the International Law of Military Space Operations and an editorial board member of the Journal of International Humanitarian Legal Studies. Her main research areas are public international law, international criminal law, and international humanitarian law. Vincent's current pursuing of a second PhD in political science evidences her acute interest in interdisciplinary research. Thank you for being with us too. Interdisciplinarity brings me to our next and third panelist. Dr. Prasenjit Pal is Associate Professor and former Head of the Department of Political Science at Diamond Harbor Women's University and also a former faculty and teacher in charge at the Department of Political Science at the University of Burdwan in West Bengal. He wrote his doctoral dissertation on international criminal law at Jadavpur University under Professor Gautam Kumar Basu in 2015. Prasenjit's M-Field dissertation, also written at Jadavpur, was on conflict resolution in South Asia. He has been teaching South Asian politics apart from international relations theory, global politics, foreign policy, Indian foreign policy in particular, Indian politics and international law for over 17 years at the university level now. Presented has presented numerous, numerous papers and seminars and conferences at the local, regional, national and international levels and has numerous publications to his credit too. He takes keen research interest in all those subjects he's also teaching, which I just mentioned. Presented has been guiding both doctoral and MPhil students in their research work at Burdwan University and Diamond Harbor, Diamond Harbor Women's University. He has been to Japan for his research work in 2008 under invitation of the government of Japan. His three latest books include Contemporary Essays in International Relations, India in South Asia, Challenges and Opportunities, both published in 2019, and Changing Dimensions of International Criminal Law, published in 2020, to which I could gladly contribute a chapter. Thank you for being with us, Prasenjit. And last but not least, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Gleb Boigusch. He has just taken up a new position as a postgraduate researcher at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark and is also a visiting lecturer at the University of Luxembourg. He just recently completed a stay as a visiting researcher at Uppsala University in Sweden. Prior to March 2022, he was an associate professor at Moscow State University and Higher School of Economics University in Russia, where he taught public international law and international criminal law. Gleb's research interests include international public law, international criminal law, international justice, and international human rights law, as you might have guessed. His most recent publications and talks deal with the issues of criminal responsibility for core international crimes, national implementation of international law in the Russian legal order, and the history of international criminal justice. 
He's an editorial board member at the Criminal Law Forum and the Revue Internationale de Droit Penal. Gleb holds his law degree from Moscow State University and defended his PhD on the UN Convention Against Corruption in 2004. From 2012 until 2015, he was an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law at Freiburg, Germany. Gleb has frequently acted as an expert before the courts of various jurisdictions and international organizations. He is a member of the International Law Association's Committee on the Use of Force. And he is included in the list of assistants to counsel before the International Criminal Court. So to you too, thank you for being with us. You see, all of our panelists have plenty of expertise on the topic we are addressing today. Before I give the floor to our first panelists, allow me to make some quick remarks on housekeeping. We invite you to already post your questions during our panelists' talks in the Q&A or F&A box, depending on your language selection. You can also upvote other participants' questions there if you wanted to ask the same. Please refrain from writing questions in the chat. When we open the floor after all talks will have been delivered, you may also press the raise hand button and we will then give you permission to turn on your camera and microphone so that you may ask your question or make your comment in person. All right, without further ado, I'll give the floor to our first speaker. Julia, take it off. Hello, can you see me? We can hear you, just not yet see you. Okay, because uh, it says the host stopped the video, so maybe... Ah, uh, I'm sorry, I'll just yeah. fix that briefly. I'm very sorry, just give me a second. Of course. Now it should be working. Can you try it again? Yes. Perfect. Ah, <laughs> sorry excellent. No worries. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for uh, inviting me and for, your, uh, introdu for introducing me. It is really a pleasure to be part of this uh, timely and important discussion. Uh, so the objective of my of my presentation is as follows. How to understand the apparent paradox. On the one hand, um, we, we see that the actions uh, of Russia in Ukraine are blatantly illegal. On the other hand, uh, for Russia, it is important to justify its actions by international law. So in my presentation, I will briefly outline uh, Russian government's uh, and Russian academia position on the use of force uh, in Ukraine. Uh, then I will then briefly um, posit them or frame them within the larger um, historical development uh, of Russian positions on these issues. And specifically, I will use the norms of sovereignty, principle of non-intervention, pr principle of self-determination as used in the post-Soviet space. Then I will try to distill certain features on, of Russian approaches to these norms. And lastly, I will uh, outline uh, the ways uh, forward. So in the build-up to Russian invasion to Ukraine, we have all probably watched or at least took notice of two spe speeches by uh, Russian president. Uh, one which, uh, which was delivered just before the recognition of Donetsk and Lugansk People's Re Republic on 21st uh, February. And the second one, which was broadcast just before the invasion of Ukraine. And these two speeches re relied heavily on international law. So in order to, to justify recognition of the People's Republics, President uh, echoed the concept, very controversial concept of so-called remedial secession. According to remedial secession, uh, if central government severely oppress or persecutes the minority in, in states, this minority uh, is uh, entitled to create its own state as a remedy to this persecution. 
So that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, President Putin used the uh, actually fabricated claim of uh, Ukrainian genocide in Donbass. In the second speech, uh, uh, which concerned uh, Russian justification of use of force, President Putin explicitly referred to Article 51 of the UN Charter and uh, inherent right of self-defense of the uh, People's Republic, which has just been recognized by Russia. And again, uh, this was done based on the fabricated claim of Ukrainian attack of these, of these territories. And it is quite interesting also to uh, know that the speech of President Putin of 24th uh, February was attached uh, to the letter, to the official letter of the Russian Federation um, to the UN Security Council um, in line with the requirements of Article 51. So, however, despite these claims of compliance uh, with international law, overall message of these, of these speeches was completely incompatible with one of the cornerstones, cornerstone principles of international law, which is uh, sovereign equality of states. Um, in fact, uh, Ukraine was portrayed or envisioned in these speeches as not as a fully fledged sovereign state, but as a some sort of accident, uh, accidental outcome of history um, with no agency whatsoever, uh, and now seen as a puppet in the uh, hand of Western states. So how did the Russian ac academia uh, react to the invasion of Ukraine. So obviously it is difficult to assess what Russia's lawyer, Russian lawyers really think, uh, given the 15 years uh, post potential uh, jail term uh, in case only of simply calling the special operation uh, war. And I'm sure the professor, professor Bogush will have more accurate insights uh, on this than I do. But generally, the Russian academia, uh, or international law academia in Russia, tends to support the Russian government positions. And in this regard, as an illustration, I will present one concrete example. So one day after the invasion, uh, the executive head of the Russian International Law Association published a reminder confirming the significance of certain principles of international law, such as prohibition of the use of force, adding that it was appropriate at this moment. So meaning one day after the invasion started. And despite the fact that this, this message really did not contain any concrete or direct, uh, uh, di direct condemnation of Russia's use of force, uh, this message already provoked rather vitriol reaction from the presidium of this, uh, of this association, which uh, later issued its own letter, uh, where also criticized the, this executive head by pointing to the fact that in other situations, for example, United States violated um, prohibition of the use of force, there were no such a, uh, no such a, a reminder of uh, importance of the principle of non-use of force. And Presidium also highlighted uh, the illegality of so-called uh, coup in Ukraine in 2014, and highlighted the need for a special operation um, by Russia to liberate Donbas from Ukrainian Nazis. So we see that despite very mild and implied criticism by this, uh, by this executive head, the presidium basically completely uh, aligned with Russian government position. So coming back to Russian president's pre-war speeches, um, many see, saw them as uh, shocking and even deranged, but uh, for close observers, um, in many aspects, uh, the arguments used fit within the broader previous historical narrative of the Russian government. So I believe to understand the present, we need to look back to 1991, uh, how the Soviet Union dissolved. Uh, Ukrainian historian Sergei Plohi asked, why did Russians let the empire fall without uh, any war, without ma major conflict? Indeed for Plohi, the breakup of the Soviet Union is a unique case in the, in the history of empires. And it would seem to me that 30 years later, we are witnessing its re reinterpretation in an utterly violent way. As Plohi argues, Russian elites thought that eventually um, former Soviet republics, including Ukraine, would have to return to Russian fault uh, to get the access to Russian resources and trade. Plohi claims that ultimately the idea was not there that the split would be permanent. And I believe the use of international law in the post-Soviet space really confirms this premise. 
And uh, I would like to highlight three periods in the post-Soviet uh, development. So in the first period, just after the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, Russia in its official discourse subscribed to the, to, the, to the norm of sovereign equality of states, principle of non-intervention, um, and, uh, and also importantly subscribed to the principle of uti possidatis juris, by which we mean respect for inherited Soviet boundaries uh, as new borders of the newly emerged state former republics. Of course, this conformed to the fact that Russia at the time was weakened and uh, itself was afraid of secessionism and its own survival as a Russian federation. The secession, secessionist threat came from Chechnya and even Tatarstan. Um, in this context, during this period, the norm of territorial integrity in the context of the secessionist fight uh, in Chechnya and Tatarstan was unequivocally upheld by the Russian Constitutional Court. And we can also see that in this period, Russia never directly or never officially recognize any of the new secessionist entities which emerged in, let's say, Moldova or Georgia. On the other hand, however, uh, in fact, uh, Russia violated these principles and covertly supported the separatists. Some politicians, main, mainly from the Russian Duma, uh, openly voiced the support for the separatists, mainly in areas where Russian speakers um, were, were minorities. However, this was never at this time uh, an official governmental position. So already in this first period, we can see certain schism between on the one hand, uh, official narrative on, on law, and on the other hand, uh, uh, facts on the ground. But since these violations were never acknowledged and were hidden, this tension did not appear too large. In my opinion, this has changed uh, after the recognition by Western state of Kosovo in 2008. Obviously, this is not to justify in any way uh, nobody's, uh, no state's violations. It is just merely a statement of fact. Um, the Declaration of Independence of Kosovo was issued in February 2008. And already in March, we can see change of Russia's attitude towards, for example, breakaway territories of Georgia, uh, which, which led to further formalization of the relations and ultimately led to Russia's recognition of these territories in August 2008, after the war in Georgia. At the time, President Medvedev uh, justified recognition by a claim, of, again fabricated, of Georgia's um, genocide in South Ossetia. And again, the same argument was used by states to justify their recognitions of Kosovo. Later on, during the Kosovo advisory proceedings, Russia also for the first time, uh, uh, upheld the existence of the limited right of remedial secession, um, quite contrary to the previous position of its own constitutional court. And the same approach was uh, later um, taken also in Crimea. Um, importantly, large sections of the annexation speech after the, after the annexation referred to Kosovo advisory opinion. And President Putin, among, among others, said with respect to the West recognizing Kosovo and denying the same for Crimea. I said, this is not even double standards. This is amazing, primitive, blunt cynicism. One should not try so crudely to make everything suit their interest, calling the same thing white today and black tomorrow. It should be added also that in Eastern Ukraine, Russia denied its military presence there until the February invasion. So I argue that during this period, uh, we are already witnessing a true lawfare using international law to gain strategic goals. Uh, this is characterized by three characteristics. So first, first of all, justification of its action by law. So law is an important part uh, of its actions and especially law which was previously weakened by certain actions of western states the second aspect is then applying this law to fabricate these scenarios and the last aspect is denial denial of crucial facts for example previous or continued support of separatists so i would argue it was not an accident that crimea was not directly annexed by russia but annexation only followed the fabricated uh, referendum it was also not an accident that 
there were little green men rather than Russian armed forces who took over Crimea. This allowed, this, this, these were intentional policy choices which allowed Russia to use these three elements that I just mentioned. And this approach has many advantages for Russia. So first of all, it creates confusion among foreign stakeholders. Therefore, it also decreases the condemnations, the level of condemnation and protest. Um, it also allows Russia to still be portrayed as a law obeying state. It also does not put uh, into question all post-Soviet boundaries. In any case, it was separatists who created new states, not Russia who violated territorial integrity of parent states. And ultimately, it allows Russia Russia to preserve certain power in this in this post-Soviet space. However, I would say that this uh, period, um, period of lawfare, or, uh, this ambiguity, hybrid lawfare, maskyoka, ended with the Russian aggression in Ukraine. Yes, I, I, I said previously that uh, similar arguments were made already before, but I see two key differences which uh, differentiated this current period from, from the past. So first of all, is the program of this open radical nationalism, as I already mentioned, the complete denial of Ukrainian sovereignty, uh, which was not really present in the discourse before. And secondly, is the scale of violations, which offers no plausible denial, deniability. So from all these, all these uh, periods, we can distill certain features of Russian approaches to international law applied in near abroad or in the post-Soviet space. So for, first of all, I think and that, that is the key, is that Russia always positioned itself vis-a-vis -vis the West and vis-a-vis -vis the Western violation. Whether it is in terms of its legal arguments, I mentioned uh, use of um, remedial secession, or maybe we can point out also to what about this in, uh, what about this in, in terms of illegal use of force. But also in practice, I would point out, for example, the beginning of the of the war in Ukraine, and I think first or second day, uh, Russia bombarded the television tower in Kiev, which mirrors the NATO's bombing of television tower in Belgrade during 1999 bombings. What are the objectives? So objectives, uh, among others, is to teach the West lesson to point out to its double standards. And as pointed by Professor Marxo uh, in his book that you already mentioned, Nuria, Symmetry with the West became part of its ideology, of Russian's ideology of international law. And we indeed can point out that positioning, uh, Russia's positioning vis-a-vis -vis West has really long roots in, in Russian political and uh, cultural history. As a second aspect of these Russian approaches is, again, importance of being perceived as a, as a, as a law-abiding state, even though obviously, um, as I mentioned, it has many uh, different aspects. And again, we can say, see that this is in order to portray, portray, be portrayed vis-a-vis -vis West as West being the violator by Russia is law-abiding. And the last one is, uh, last feature is using international law as a tool in a lawfare with three characteristics that I mentioned previously. So lastly, in terms of way forward, I believe the schism between Western Russia, in terms of international law arguments, is now so large that it is impossible to be overcome in current political configuration. And possible only understanding can be perhaps found uh, in the East. And we will see that from our other speakers. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Well, thank you, Julia. Um, this were, these were really interesting insights um, into connecting state practice and scholarly rhetoric to some degree. I'm sure we will hear, hear more on that from Professor Bogos later, as you said, um, and drawing certain lines between the events since 1991 and today. Um, so I, I, I'm already formulating questions in my head myself. Um, and um, We'll look forward to discussing it later. For now, um, let's move on eastwards um, to China, notably. In 1953, the then Prime Minister, Zhou Enlai, formulated five principles of Chinese foreign politics. 
According to the Chinese ambassador to Germany, at least, these principles are still guiding the Asian superpowers' international relations today. These are mutual respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference in each other's internal affairs, equality and cooperation for mutual benefit, and peaceful coexistence. I might be stating the obvious when I say that all of these five principles seem to be highly relevant in the international legal discourse generally and for the war in Ukraine specifically. So I very much look forward to the perspectives on China and possible Chinese approaches to international law that Bin Xin Zhang will give us now. Bin Xin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so, so glad to be here to share some observations. Um, about the Chinese approaches. And it was really interesting for me to hear from Yulia and to see um, a lot of similarities, but at the same time, a lot of differences as well between um, the Russian and the Chinese perspectives. I would try to first share my, my palm point. Um, let's see if that works. Does, it, does everyone see the slides? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So what I would do in, in, this, um, in this presentation is that I would follow the three questions that, um, that were asked by our host. Um, so first concerning the current positions and rhetoric by state officials and academics, and then trace back to history and look at the background of these current positions. And finally, I would try to um, talk about the way forward. So the questions posed under this is, um, what would the fallout, what, what, be, what will be the fallout of the, the conflict on, on Chinese approaches to international law and how would that impact um, the exchange between Chinese scholars of international law and their counterparts from elsewhere. So I start with the current positions. So the question raised was about um, state officials and academics, but I would also like to add the aspect of ordinary citizens and especially netizens because um, social media has actually become the main forum in which these uh, discussions take place. Um, so one question that was raised was, is that do, do, do I see a uh, wide agreement between these different actors or do I see an ongoing debate? I would pick up that question first because my answer to that question is rather paradoxical and I find that very interesting because there is actually wide disagreement. Um, I was myself very surprised to see how diverged the views are. Um, and how extreme and e emotional um, a lot of the times um, these, these discussions and these expressions of views could be. Um, but at the same time, in terms of debate, um, it's paradoxical because I cannot say that, I cannot answer a, a, a real yes to that question because one, one, see, one sees on social media really fierce debate, as I said, at times very emotional. Um, but at the same time, in terms of academic, more academic, more serious, but technical sort of legal debate, I don't see a lot. Um, and I think one of the reasons is quite obvious is the self-censorship and the censorship. So as it remains uh, some, something that is politically very sensitive, I think that a lot of scholars would be reluctant to, to openly comment uh, on, 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 the, on the issue. Um, and also there were some uh, comments, for example, there were some blog posts after the, the, the issuance of the declaration by Judge Shui in, in the, concerning the provisional measures before the ICJ proceedings. When that was issued, there were some blog posts commenting on that declaration and were deleted, were censored afterwards and you couldn't see them anymore. So, so in terms of debate, that is, it's a bit more complicated. Nevertheless, from what we can see, I would like to, so instead of disagreement, I would like to talk about two common points that I see people do share. Um, and these two points um, that I want to highlight is one is um, the, the rhetoric about Western double standard, and the other one is the acknowledgement of Russians of Russian security concern. And this is something that we can see from both pro-Russian and pro-Ukraine uh, um, comments. Um, so, so in terms of double standard, 
um, even even the ones scholars or citizens netizens who argue uh, who who argue against Russia who 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 um, uh, who consider that the invasion is illegal who give opinions um, uh, like this would also recognize that there is an is a obvious double standard uh, on the part of the West. So there is always reference to Iraq war when we talk about when people talk about Russian invasion. So there is always also um, uh, uh, re reference to, to allegations of US um, uh, uh, war crimes in Afghanistan, for example, when people talk about atrocities committed by, by, by uh, allegedly committed by Russia. So, so this is, is one one thing that um, you can see from from both sides. Um, another thing, the the acknowledgement about Russian security concern is, I, I believe a lot of um, a lot of you would already have seen that in in uh, statements, repeated statements of Chinese state officials. For example, the um, uh, spokesperson of, of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Charlie Zhang, has recently said in a, regu in a regular press conference, and this is something that has repeated again and again, and I quote, um, the US breached its assurances and continuously promoted the eastward expansion of NATO, which is undoubtedly responsible for the outbreak of the Ukraine crisis. Uh, similar um, reference was made by the, the representative of China, to the UN when um, it, when explaining China's abstention uh, from the voting of, of the J resolution, um, Judge Shui also referred to security concerns, security issue in her um, in her declaration uh, concerning the provision of measure. Um, and notably, this is also something that that scholars and and commentators when uh, who are pro-Ukraine who, who, who criticized the invasion would recognize as well. Um, and there is one interview by um, Professor Wang Jiangyu, a renowned international professor, international law professor um, from the City University of Hong Kong, who invoked a concept that is quite interesting to, to, for, for understanding um, a Chinese idea of, of law, uh, which is in Chinese, qingli, which literally means emotions and reason. So he was saying that um, there is obviously violation of, of law, but at the same time, one need to also consider uh, things beyond the law. So it's 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 a bit like the legitimacy versus legality kind of consideration. Not he was not saying that Russian invasion was legitimate, but he was saying that there are reasons, complexities that one has to consider also behind um, behind the, um, the, the 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 violation. Um, and this in, this is interesting, and I bring this up because it reflects a traditional understanding of law generally in the in the Chinese culture, in the Chinese tradition. Um, there is a saying which says, "Law does not go beyond human emotions." And here, human emotions. It's, it's again a literal translation, but the actual Chinese word refers to something more than emotions. It's more like emotions and reason combined as opposed to uh, black letter law, which is inflexible. So, um, so this is something that I see a bit different from what uh, Yulia just described, that Russia had this period of, of lawfare, what she called the period of lawfare, where it tried to justify its actions in terms of law. Um, and what I see here in the Chinese case is, is not that there's so much a difference in terms of interpretations of particular legal concepts and legal rules, but there is a difference in terms of how um, people see the place of law in um, the society, the place of law in um, making sense of the word and in directing one's uh, actions. And another thing that I want to point out is a connection, is an obvious connection between these two common points that I just mentioned, um, which is uh, there is a feeling of, of discontent um, about Western and, and particularly American hegemony, a feeling of injustice, uh, because there is the impression that the US could could um, use its material power to do whatever it wants, 
But when someone else does the same thing, it then uses its discursive power to stigmatize um, the, 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 the latter, the, the other actor. So in the sense to, to answer so one of the sub questions posted by our host, uh, whether there is um, a, use, a, a tendency of using international law as a, as a geopolitical tool, I would say that it's rather that there is this, this um, belief or this rhetoric of accusing the West of using international law as, as a geopolitical tool. And this leads me to the second point, which is the background, because this belief of the West uses international law as, as a tool of power, as a tool of hegemony, is something that has a very deep historical root. Um, and for, to understand this, I have to take us really back in time to the late 19th century, um, the late Qin Dynasty, where in the, the common mainstream um, historical narrative of China, of, of, of uh, history of international law, um, is believed to be the beginning of international law in China, the encounter of international law and China, or the introduction of international law to China, by the West. Um, and what is important for our discussion here to understand is that from the very beginning, this historical narrative um, depicts international law in a way that it is accompanied, uh, it, it, it is something that accompanied the, um, the invasion of China by the West. So if, if the military invasion were um, based on, was based on material power, then international law was one of the things one of the ideological tools that was used um, to facilitate that invasion. So I will give just one example on that, which is the treaty port system, known in China as the unequal treaty system, which refers to a series of, of, of treaties that were signed between the Western powers uh, and, China, and, and China, the Qing government at that time, uh, which granted a lot of a series of privileges to um, the Western powers in China, including the consular jurisdiction. Um, so these unequal treaty system is something that has a prominent place in all historical textbooks of modern, of Chinese modern history. Um, it is also um, in every international law textbook in the chapter that introduces the history of international law in China. So it, it, it's it's um, it's something that is considered as, as a typical example uh, of how international law serves the interest of the powerful states in the detriment of uh, weaker states um, and how it shows uh, Western hypocrisy because, um, because it, it, the West uses the rhetoric of law and justice, uh, but only to serve its own um, interest. So, so these, um, so so this is really the the something that that dates back a very long time and and with a, a deep historical um, root. Um, and another sub question that was raised under under this theme was, are there any historical events um, that shape Chinese approaches to international law? And that is also a very good question because um, I would actually I, I would use the example from. Um, uh, one scholar who who has one Chinese scholar who has uh, started the, the uh, that very question and who answered that very question uh, in a, in the positive. So this is Professor He Zhipeng, also a very well known international law scholar in China. Who um, so one of her, his main research areas is precisely Chinese approaches to international law, um, and he 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 argues he has always been arguing that historical experiences and, and Chinese understanding of, of those um, historical experiences have shaped China's approaches to international law today. Um, and he has pointed to a lot of different uh, historical events as significant. I would take just one example, which is the, the Paris Peace Conference after the First World War. And the story goes that um, the Chinese delegation had very high hope before the conference because they wanted to reclaim a, a leased territory, a German leased territory in the Shandong Peninsula, which was occupied by Japan in 1914. Um, but at the conference in the end, the, it was decided that the, the territory would be transferred to Japan instead of returning to China. The Chinese deleg delegation was very disappointed and it um, stirred a, a public outrage in China. So um, 
Professor He used this and other significant historical events to, 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 to pose the argument that it is these sort of events which created a sense of betrayal um, that, that China still uh, holds today. Um, and, and that it believed that um, international law is contrary to what pro it promises. It's not a defender of justice, but instead um, a, a, a true of power. Um, so, but my point of referring to, to, to this example, and this is just one example, there are other similar arguments by other scholars as well. Um, and my point of referring to this is, is not much to say that I, the historical events themselves created um, the distrust. Um, I think it's precisely this, this sort of interpretations, this sort of narratives, memories that are created, precisely like the one that Professor He has been has been advancing that shaped China's approaches to international law. Um, and of course, that those, if we talk about China, Chinese approaches to international law, they're not only shaped by this sort of memories, they're shaped by many other things as well. Um, at, a, at a particular um, given moment, it's also always influenced um, by pragmatic considerations, geopolitical interests. So there are always a lot of different things that have, um, have a role to play in, in, in determining in um, the approaches or actual practices of international law. But then what happens is that scholars, officials as well, people would then start to make sense of what happened. People would start to make sense of these practices and how they evolve. Um, and in that sense, they create then theories, rhetoric, that create explanations as well as justifications for certain actions. So in the end, you have the narratives, interpretations, justifications on the one hand. Um, and on the other hand, you have the actual practices which reinforce each other. And they will naturally have a tendency of, um, of seeking a sort of a, 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 a inner um, consistency. And in this way, in this way, this process goes on. And in the end, they produce something um, that we would consider uh, Chinese approaches to international law, which would then still keep evolving. Um, and then finally, to answer the last uh, question, um, to briefly to give my answer to the, to, the, to the two questions that are posed, I do not think that um, the conflict as and of its own would have a significant change on Chinese approaches to international law as well, nor would it be on exchanges between Chinese international lawyers and their counterparts, because as just stated, as just argued, I think this formation of approaches is a process that goes very long back in history and will always evolve. And one event, no matter how significant it is, would not have um, as would not alone have a, a significant impact. Um, but what is interesting, um, when I saw the question was, I immediately thought of an, an immediate um, impact on domestic discussion, uh, which for me was quite surprising to see that um, the attention was so high and, and, and the, the debate that there were so many divergence of views. Um, and I think one thing that was that was positive in this whole process was that there are so as as I said I mentioned before that um, I think partly because at least partly because of the censorship there are there are not a lot of real legal debates going on but um, at the same time people try to talk about the issue without really commenting. Uh, without giving too much their own opinions. And one of the ways to do that is by introducing um, um, legal concepts, introducing basic norms, um, and also by translating. So there is, for example, the Chinese Initiative in, of International Law, this NGO working on international law in China, has been publishing a series of articles translating um, um, articles written in, 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 in English um, on the on the issue, so so there are ways that um, that these kind of uh, international norms and concepts are introduced, which would not which was what were not noticed before so much by the public, but now are noticed. So I think uh, that is that is something that um, I saw as as new in in this um, in this situation. So finally, I would end by 
say that I think the bottom line is that I, I really think that dialogue, dialogues, communications and understanding are very important domestically as well as internationally. And that is why I think um, a seminar like this is, is a very applaudable um, effort because we could see different perspectives. And I want to end um, with um, a quote from, uh, from Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist who studies morality um, and who applies the th his theory of morality on American political divide. Of course, it's a very different context, but I think that is nonetheless uh, applicable as well. Um, he says, morality binds and blinds. It binds us into ideological teams that fight each other as though the fate of the world depended on our side winning each battle. It blinds us to the fact that each team is composed of good people who have something important to say, end of quote. So I think that um, no matter how differences, di different, um, I really, oh, hold on. We, we all, there are so many different opinions and I was referring to the, the, the large um, divergence of views in China as well as so domestically, internationally, there are a lot of differences. But I hope that despite of these differences, we still have that capacity to listen to this important something that the other side has to say. Um, thank you very much. I look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Binxin. Um, it's been a pleasure for all of us, I think, to listen to your views, um, because, of course, getting access to the legal discourse in China is pretty difficult for many persons outside of China who do not speak Ch Chinese, um, also because of that language barrier you have mentioned. Um, I can say it from my own experience, I've been trying to learn Chinese since the beginning of this year, and I don't think I will ever in this life on Earth manage to uh, speak or read Chinese on an academic level. So thank you for that. Um, I will remind our audience that they can already start writing questions into uh, the F&A, Q&A box um, if they wish. Um, but for the moment, let's move on to South Asia. I hope you will note my perfect transition here. Zhu and Lai's five principles I mentioned before were notably incorporated in the 1954 Sino-Indian Agreement. That agreement was to adjust certain trade relations between the two countries and interestingly expired in 1962, just before the Sino-Indian War broke out. So it's sort of a vignette highlighting the role that both goods and arms play in international relations and how the tide can turn as to which one has the upper hand. As of today, India has been maintaining its trade relations to Russia, notwithstanding the aggression. Notably, India has also abstained from voting on the United Nations resolutions regarding the situation in Ukraine that essentially condemned the Russian acts. So I very much look forward to the background to these Indian perspectives that Prasenjit Pal will now provide for us. Prasenda, the floor is yours. A very good evening and uh, thank you, Julia. And uh, I do extend my heartfelt thanks to all the faculty members and support staff at uh, Frederick Alexander University for inviting me to this uh, prestigious panel. Well, uh, the theme is uh, lawfare in Ukraine, right? Uh, in the background of this present uh, Ukrainian crisis is Russian invasion of Ukraine. Since I'm a student of international relations and strategic studies, I would like to start with the, with the background of this crisis. Actually, the, uh, the strategic landmass or the tectonic shift in the strategic landmass which it has created, right? Uh, so there is a debate raging in academic circles that this is a, that we are now standing at the crossroads of a new global order. This is being branded as Putin's war. Let us get to the, um, uh, let us throw a little insight into this. So uh, we can start by saying that this geopolitical consequences in the aftermath of the Russian aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine. This has, uh, in, in fact, this has accelerated a little shift, a tectonic shift in the world order. And this is forcing a renewed uh, balance of power. The, uh, we were experiencing a, um, we are in the midst of a, uh, of a, a new COVID global order. And now analysts are now calculating the implications of rebalancing and positioning for significant changes. The ongoing, uh, uh, the crisis, this is assumed global proportions and many observers do feel 
that it may pose uh, a, a renewed threat to global peace and security and, and may even lead, lead to a World War III. Now we, we can find Ukraine, Ukraine is ravaged, it's war ravaged, right? Russia is the aggressor and, 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 and we have to suffer long-term consequences. The US-led NATO has, has, has strengthened itself and, and it's forcing the rebalance. Europe is undergoing a human security crisis, uh, which has stemmed from, the, uh, uh, from, uh, from refugee flows across the Russian borders and a demilitarization. China has made a strategic choice in opposing Western uh, and, and European actions against Russia. It has opposed NATO's expansion and sanctions and calls for diplomatic solutions by recognizing Russia's legitimate security concerns and supports Russia in, in uh, UN Security Council as well as the General Assembly. I'll, I'll come to the law of I think, but before that, I'm just uh, uh, taking the strategic equations that is uh, um, inherent in the crisis. Now, if, if you come to the Indi India's position, right? So India and many countries of the global south, they face a geostrategic pressure as they calibrate their positions. India is maintaining a stance of neutrality or what we can call strategic neutrality. It has abstained from voting against Russia in the UN Security Councils and in and the various UN resolutions that, that condemn the Russian invasion. And this has drawn international attention. India is somewhat trying to play a balancing game between its uh, time-tested strategic ally, Russia, and the US, which is its, its, its new strategic ally with whom it is now forging ties. And hence it is maintaining a stance of strategic neutrality. Now this is being branded as Putin's war. So what has been the official, not, not actually the official statement or, or uh, we can uh, uh, envisage it, 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 it as a Russian, uh, uh, Russian uh, argument in leading this inv invasion. The, uh, the declared Russian goal behind this, this, this has been branded as a special military operation in Ukraine is to protect the people, especially the ethnic Russians who have been subjected to genocide by the Kiev regime for eight years, as well as the demilitarization and denazification, is noted demilitarization and denazification of Ukraine, as well as bringing to justice those who committed numerous uh, bloody crimes against the citizens, including especially the citizens of Russian Federation. Putin also declared that his plans do not include occupation of Ukrainian territories, but we have seen what has uh, happened in, in Ukraine. But during the course of the invasion of Ukraine, there has been a protracted warfare and occupation of Ukrainian territories, incessant killing and destruction is taking place, with the battle lines being drawn between Russia on one side and US-led uh, US NATO powers of Europe on the other. And, and uh, this has reduced, uh, uh, there has been virtually reduced to a Russia versus West conflict. The core issue of the conflict, now come to the core issue of the conflict which is actually the Russian desire to scuttle Western influence in Ukraine, particularly NATO expansion and, 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 uh, and, and a proposed plan for Ukrainian inclusion in NATO as and an aspiration to project Russian imperial vision and imperial power and recover its lost ground in the post-Soviet space, uh, which we can refer to the Earth's file Soviet space during the Cold War and extending its influence and support to Russian and other ethnic minorities and, and uh, ethnic dissatisfied minorities in the former Soviet republics, recreating a Russian sphere of influence to counter with the Western one in Eurasia, and an attempt to destroy Ukrainian military infrastructure and creation of an Eastern Ukrainian buffer for Russia in order to get an access to the Black Sea. This is strategic access. This is the ultimate aim. Sorry, Prasenjit, may I interrupt you for a second? Audience is asking whether you can slow down a bit for understandability. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay. But I was actually uh, just hinting at uh, the um, uh, hinting at the fact that we are now standing at the crossroads of a new global order following this this, this protracted Russian invasion of, of of Ukraine and what had had been the rationale behind the Russian invasion, right? And this has led to a tectonic geopolitical shift in the context of the present global order and the strategic map of the globe now coming to the context uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the context of lawfare and how can we define lawfare uh, right so lawfare is a strategic use of law by an actor in the international system with the aim of advancing a cause or gaining advantage over its adversaries this is a definition by french researcher adrian Essev, right and now if you can look at the um, Ukrainian crisis since the invasion of of of, uh, of of Ukraine by Russia, Ukraine has not only put up an un unexpected military resistance, 
but has also demonstrated a very quick and remarkable mastery of, over judicial tools. Now, what? Uh, there's been an allegation of war crimes by the Russian soldiers as mandated by the, its, its leaders in Ukraine. So how can we define war crime actually? Hmm, for, for, uh, uh, for all, I think some students must, must be there. The International Military Tribunal, right, in, in Nuremberg in 1945, defines war crime as, it's, it's, it's a violation of the laws and customs of war, like uh, ill treatment, deportation into slave labor, or for any other purposes on the civilian population. Uh, please note the civilian population may be deemed as the non-combatants. And as, uh, as per the analysis of international humanitarian law, non-combatants should be spared from attack. The non-military establishment, especially the civilian establishments, um, in, in the civilian est establishments, casualties must be minimized, right? And any uh, collateral civilian damage, uh, 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 the, the combatants must, must uh, the belligerents and the combatants must refrain from those attacks on the, especially the civilian targets, right? And what is crimes? In fact, this define uh, this in fact uh, in, in in the uh, Nuremberg trial, three three categories of crimes were classified: crimes against peace, that is planning, preparation for, or, or waging a war of aggression. Now Russia has been accused of waging a war of aggression, right? Uh, and as as well as uh, it's been accused of conducting crimes against humanity, which is murder extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhuman acts committed against the civilian population before or during the war. Am I now audible, right? Or I'm going a little in a speedy fashion. Julia, think, uh, is, is it okay? Yeah, it I okay? think for me it's good now. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, okay, right. So, <clears throat> Achha, now, I, if, uh, now if I go into the details of what sort of allegations have been uh, levied against, uh, um, against the Russian troops uh, regarding this war crimes thing, right? Now, there has been a heavy uh, bombing, missile attacks, artillery shellings, and multi multiple rocket launches on civilian buildings, which we can, uh, uh, and, and, and incessant killing of civilians in Busha, Mariupol, Kharkiv, and even targeting of uh, nuclear reactors, right? And if I can give you some data, there's been usage of cluster munitions. These sort of weapons are, 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 are being banned under the international legal regime uh, uh, regarding war crimes, right? And even health centers have been attacked, right? And other explosive devices have been especially used in widely densely populated areas, and there are evidences of that. Although Russia has claimed that it is, it is only using precision guided weapons. But uh, there's been uh, clear evidence of usage of cluster munitions, which are banned during, uh, uh, in fact, these are in violation of the laws of warfare, right? War is not being, um, uh, um, war is not outlawed in international law, but its conduct has been regulated. Hmm. I can refer to my uh, great grandfather, Dr. Adhavinath Pal's judgment in the Tokyo trial, a, a, a few points, which, which, which is very important in this context. So now, uh, regarding this, uh, the, if, if you say this, is this the Indian position, right? I, I can refer to his argument in the Tokyo trials. But it, it was a different context. He argued for the notion of victor's justice that in any warfare, if uh, uh, if, if 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 one belligerent um, uh, um, seems to win a war, and 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 another belligerent loses a war, the belligerent cannot constitute a court and try the other belligerent who loses a war. And, and, and this may only come, uh, come up as a victor's justice. This, uh, this goes beyond the legal framework, right? Now, one thing which he hinted at was that there is a prerequisite for the creation of any uh, international community, right? So if we look at the present status of the international community, the International Criminal Court has started investigations, right? And even I, I, I can come up with some data uh, that uh, in, in, from Ukraine itself, mm, from Ukraine, there's a Ukraine Pro Prosecutor General Irene Venedik uh, uh, Venedikova. She, uh, in, fa in fact, uh, they have initiated uh, uh, initi uh, they have initiated an investigation, and there has been a joint uh, uh, joint table investigation also with the International Criminal Court, as we can find some statements. Right now, they have found around eight thousand six hundred cases. Because this data was released just in uh, late April of, of our crimes. But the main thing remains, who will bail the cat? I come up with some issues. 
that the legal mechanism is there. There is another, uh, I, I just want to place before you one thing that international law has often been branded as the vanishing point of jurisprudence. The legal mechanisms are there, but how can they be enforced? Look, there's a situation. Uh, 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 Russia and Ukraine are, are not members of the ICC. 39 other states have brought the cases before the ICC, International Criminal Court. But can Russia be indicted? Can Putin, yes, Putin has been branded as the main war criminal of the 21st century. A lot of slogans are there. Hmm. Take him to court. Then what, what can be the option? Whether ICC can have a jurisdiction in this case or a, a, a hybrid sort of a tribunal can be set up. Now, my great grandfather argued that setting up of ad hoc tribunals cannot, um, uh, cannot in fact, uh, come up with the actual legal things, right? It's, it's legality may be questioned. So we are now in a very tricky situation. Countries are now taking this case to the International Criminal Court. There is a debate going on whether the ICC can have jurisdiction regarding this. And even if it has, this can take, um, uh, this can go on for years to come to a conclusion. So justice delayed, maybe justice denied. So fast track thing may be creation of, an, uh, of a tribunal, a local tribunal, but who, who is going to constitute that? There, there remains a debate. So this now points up to a higher debate, which I can, uh, for which I'm referring to Dr. Pulse, uh, a little part of his judgment that he, during the course of his dissension judgment at the Tokyo trials in 1946, came up with the notion of whether there's an international community, right? So his argument was, in, in a world where, uh, in fact, uh, the violating states are what? Uh, how can they be uh, punished by universally applicable rules? It is the states which make the rules and it is the states which violate them. So where lies the binding force, right? Uh, uh, international law is the vanishing point of jurisprudence. Uh, it suffers from a belling the cat problem. Who is going to enforce this, right? And great power politics, like this, in, in fact, they act as deterrents in this process. So the UN, the UN Security Council, they are all. Uh, in, in fact, the major powers are working in tandem. The European powers have all condemned the crisis. But can they join hands in setting up a uh, court, international court where the Russian leaders may be tried? The the Nuremberg trials came up with a very important thing: individual criminal responsibility. Right? Uh, the Russian soldiers are. Uh, inflicting attacks on the civilian population. A lot of evidences are there. They are they have shut down the um, humanitarian corridors, right? This is, in fact, uh, uh, a refugee crisis has also stemmed secondarily from this crisis, which has led to a human security crisis. But uh, what needs to be done? Who is going to control the? A lot of condemnation is there. China has taken a position, right? It is su supporting Russia, uh, Russia to some extent, right? But so far as the humanitarian aspect of this crisis is concerned, my ar argument is there. This is not actually the Indian position. India is making a strategic neutrality. It has condemned the Bush attacks, that's right. But if you go to um, a larger context of humankind, we all are ultimately humans, we need to survive. What is happening on the Ukrainian citizens, this is going beyond humanitarian norms. So how to stop this? This remains a larger question. Taking people to court, Forming, uh, through the ICC or an adult uh, tribunal, then that goes on in, in, in a protracted way. This, this doesn't uh, uh, cause well for the, uh, uh, this doesn't augur well for the greater cause of humanity. So legal principles are there, the international legal principles. It is up to the states to adhere to that. International community and international legal regime. It is up to the international community to accept the binding force of law. Right, this is what he had to say that at all, what international community are we referring to? Law has a binding force only when it is being adhered by the international community. And otherwise setting up of any ad hoc tribunal for meeting out justice will, will not cause this, uh, um, will not uh, cause the, uh, will not be uh, going up the equivalence of uh, international humanitarian law. Will, will not uh, serve the purpose of, inter of, of implementing international humanitarian laws. This is what I had to argue. And in my uh, concluding part, I would like to say that then what 
lies the uh, wherein lies the solution now, uh, the international legal regime how can it interrogate this humanitarian crisis in, in ukraine the conflict needs to be stopped right russian uh, to withdrawal russia needs to uh, roll back from the position that's okay and, and there is mounting international pressure on russia sanctions are there but wherein lies the role of the international community and the international legal regime ultimately diplomatic channels of negotiation right uh, non coercive channels of negotiation needs to be opened up right and only when international legal principles are adhered to by the international community then only this th uh, th this thing will work right this has been I mean, a lot of data i have found regarding this crisis there has been a huge Uh, humanitarian crisis uh, uh, fold with this uh, ukraine in, uh, in fold, uh, fold with this russian invasion of ukraine of, of, of ukraine but if you come to india's position official position india is maintaining a strategic neutrality okay india has condemned the bush attacks that's fine but but what if if you go by the um, the international legal principles is is india supporting the russian case or the ukraine case it 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 it, it, it opens up a corridor of uncertainty right but if we if we go beyond this debate what is the indian position what is the russian position what is the chinese position ultimately what is actually the global position we have to survive as one in fact covid taught us to, to survive as um, uh, as as uh, as a case of uh, biological pathogenic threat versus humanity so i think uh, going beyond this uh, going beyond this debate of, of the various positions or conflicting positions of international on 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 on, on this crisis regarding international criminal law we need to subserve the cause of humanity right thank you very much well, thank you prasenjit for these interesting insights um and for highlighting historical developments especially since the tokyo tribunal um i'm certain that the two of us will have a lot of debate uh, later on uh, because i already can say that my position on on law versus um peace or justice versus peace might be a bit different um i guess that our next speaker's position might also be a bit different and uh, i very much look forward to what uh, professor bogash can tell us now thank you julia and uh, thanks again for uh, invitation to this discussion i i think I, i see that our time is very limited so i try to be very short and just to comment on issues that where i have i think where i am in disagreement uh, or a bit depart from the views uh, expressed by other speakers and particularly with yulia because uh, she uh, commented a lot about russian discourses russian approaches to international law and the reaction of russian state and russian scholars um so i think i i have a, a i have a few concerns about uh about the 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 discussion that we have now today uh on the on the diverging approaches uh, to international law by by various states and particularly with regard to russia uh and uh its war against ukraine i think that uh we have to understand uh what what uh that that this 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 war started yes it was already said today many times uh eight years ago and we can see how uh, different uh is is actually approach to international law uh from the russian authorities if if uh, in 2014 there was proper probably some some genuine attempts to justify the action um the actions by the legal arguments and there have been some some attempts uh, that covered uh, what happened in 2014 the occupation of crimea and also uh attempts to uh, to to justify the the involvement of russia in the war in the bus but what what we have now i think is 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 uh, quite the opposite we have the uh diminishing uh influence of international law the, the diminishing uh in influence of the i would say legal component in this discussion uh so far uh, at least um, i uh, i have not seen any any proper uh, legal justification um from russian russian authorities or russian scholars uh of what uh, russia uh, has done uh, in ukraine uh in 
in the uh, its communication to the International Court of Justice that was again uh, unprecedented move unprecedented for Russia I mean uh, that Russia did not attend the court it's um, for 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 many years it's uh, Russia celebrated the uh, the the International Court of Justice it uh, has always said that it, ICJ is a proper court international court and other courts like you know like criminal courts or like um, uh, some tribunals uh, are not uh, <laughs> truly international uh, it didn't attend, didn't uh, express its views, uh, and in uh, in the if you look at the communication, it's just very it's very shortly uh, reiterate uh, just arguments on 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 the self defense, and uh, it fully reproduced uh, it references to the to the communication to the Security Council. It's very short communication. It's for me, it's the only attempt, at least to. To express the legal arguments behind the the law the use of force uh, in ukraine uh in uh, if you look at the uh statements um in particular putin statements uh on uh, on the occasion of the rec so-called recognition of so-called republics and actual uh um, escalation the the use of force uh, on the uh, 21st of February, we could see the different line of arguments and uh, references to uh, to various uh, legal legal concepts and provisions of international law. None of them has uh, uh, has presented completed uh, legal argument, at least or at least uh, coherent line of of of, of thoughts uh, uh, with regard to international law. Um, the only, uh, I think, uh, consistent argument that that uh, Russia actually used is that uh, is the is the Tukva K argument, or it's even even uh, in some situ in some in some documents it's a what about argument. So it's this it's claims. I think uh, quite maybe maybe it's, it's it's true of course that other other states also violate international law and also um, uh, also use uh, illegal uh, illegally used force against other other states. Uh, the question whether we accept such such justification uh, from uh, from the members of the United Nations. I think it's it's uh, it would be uh, it would be a grave mistake to continue to be involved in discussion where one. One party actually uh, don't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't recognize the rules of the discussion. So it's uh, the multiple reference to dialogue, which uh, have been always um, that I also heard today. Uh, I don't think it is a dialogue actually. So dialogue um, we, we assume when we speak about dialogue, we assume that there is at least certain rules of the discussion, whether it's academic discussion or it's diplomatic exchange. What we what we see with regard to use of force in Ukraine is just is just a uh, uh, line of line of arguments that mostly have very, very shaky ground in terms of international law and uh, international and of course the facts. Uh, so I recall uh, the very good analysis of Professor Peters, Anna Peters, uh, in 2014. I, I, that's uh, she. She pointed to two problems with Russian position on Crimea and Ukraine. That first, that Russia uses in its legal justification a very, very um, controversial concepts of international law concepts which have no firm ground uh, and uh, the concepts which uh, which uh, are, are not uh, anonymously supported by international legal scholars and states uh, we remind uh, we uh, discussed today already remedial secession uh, to, to the same uh, to this, the the self determination um, uh, based on uh, based on uh, this remedial Remedial secession, also the uh, preempt, uh, preemptive self-defense. Uh, uh, that's 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 actually what what uh, what what we see with we see in Russian position, and also uh, the facts. I think this is a key uh, a key problem here. So to to discuss uh, to discuss uh, to discuss um, uh, divergence approaches and so on to discuss. Uh, the legal disputes uh, we should have at least 
certain um, certain common ground in, in facts. What we have in Ukraine, we have, uh, I would say, parallel reality in which uh, not only Russian leadership, um, but unfortunately also a significant part of Russian population lives. So it's it's very, very difficult to, to discuss these things when uh, Russian uh, state officials con continuously, repeatedly use the, the, the language, uh, the humanizing language, like the Nazis or uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian Nazis, which has no, no factual basis in that. So it's, it's something which, uh, which we should not discuss at all uh, in, a serious, uh, in a serious conversation. Um, um, that's that I think it's a problem. So it's um, it's it makes the whole uh, discussion um, in many cases counterproductive. Um, talking about uh, the the maybe a broader discourse. So my conviction is that the most of the so-called approaches, as Russian approaches as to international law, is actually the they they are. These are approaches which have been developed post facto to justify certain uh, certain decisions uh, taken by by state by the state. It's not it's not uh, the kind of uh, ideology or a legal a legal uh, a legal thought which which uh, which uh, which actually form the uh, which which develop uh, which help which assisted in developing these decisions. This is just attempt to justify them using the language of international law. So um, it's different question, should we take all of them uh, seriously? Um, so what was the reaction of Russian legal uh, scholars uh, to the events in Ukraine? I think it was, um, I don't have a full cause of full insight, but um, I have impression that um, no single scholar, serious uh, international legal scholar, provided uh, the any uh, any uh, consistent legal position. Um, I mean, in tom in in the form of paper or uh, declaration, which explained what is the what is the legal basis what is the um, uh, didn't develop a legal argument justified which justified uh, the the warfare in in ukraine so the attack of russia uh, what we what we have it's it's already long time past it's two so it's uh, it's more than two months since uh, since the the attack um I couldn't find any 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 text that provided um, the legal analysis of the situation and, in fact, justified the defended Russian um, uh, Russian Federation's um, attack on Ukraine. Uh, we have several texts, mostly uh, written by by uh, the officials officials of state affiliated institutions so they are not actually uh, only scholars but officials of the uh, institutions which are mostly engaged in the debate on uh, on other countries violated international law or uh, the general threats coming from the from the um, west uh, dominated by the united states i don't think it could count as 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 a legal position because uh, what we talk today is is about uh, about the use of force, about the violations of international humanitarian law, the uh, the attack that's uh, not only illegal but uh, obviously disproportionate. It has a lot of lot of uh, concerns about uh, the compliance and implementation of international humanitarian law. Also, in Russian armed forces, it's also state obligations under IHL to um, actually to implement provisions and what we have what we have seen from the statements is not um, is not any uh, any legal argument uh, Yulia mentioned uh, a statement by the presidium of the association of uh, Russian Association of International Law, which is actually a Russian branch of uh, LAA. So that was this explained why the, there was a reaction to the executive, executive chair statement, uh, which I believe very, you know, 
not 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 very convincing <laughs> i mean and very soft given the circumstances but um i invite all uh participants to to visit the website of the international uh, of russian association of international law and try to find uh any living person any name uh of the members of this presidium you you will not find i think uh, these names uh and um, I'm not even sure uh, that presidium does exist as, as an organ. It's not. It's not mentioned at least in the old documents of this association. So it's uh, actually an, an anonymous um, uh, statement, uh, probably coming from the from the president and uh, vice president of this associations. Um, um, without any i think consultation with the member so this is this is not something some document which reflect uh any uh any discussions uh, in uh, among uh, among uh, russian lawyers uh any uh any 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 process uh of uh, of academic academic exchange so I don't think we should we should take uh, such uh, tax seriously, and mostly because not only because they are emanated from from the persons who are not um, independent uh, independent scholars, they are part of the of the state of the state system, uh, but mostly because th this is, this is no I would say academic contact cont uh, content in this uh, statements this is nothing to discuss because they are just uh, repeating uh, the statements of the of the of the state officials and most uh, importantly uh, they uh, are not uh, in they don't engage in 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 uh, academic discussion they don't dis discuss uh, interpretation of legal rules for example uh moreover they they do something which is which raises the question of about academic integrity of these people because uh, if they for example repeatedly uh repeatedly distort uh very well known uh decisions for example the cost of advisor opinion it's uh, it's uh, it is it is uh, i think common knowledge that it doesn't say anything about legality of um, of um, secession whether it's remedial or not uh but it's continuously uh, used as uh this interpretation is very often uh used in the uh, in the writings of scholars who are definitely know uh, what uh, what the icj said in kosovo advisory opinion and what was the co legal context of uh, this um, decision of the icj uh I even 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 given the fact that I left I mean Russia and my 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 university positions I see I believe I have still um, very very uh, good connection to to the Russian scholarly community and I know almost every uh, international lawyers in Russia so the so far maybe maybe um maybe i i don't know all 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 people there but uh i don't know any any living person who could um could expressed uh opinion uh supporting uh the the um, the decision to to invite ukraine or who expressed opinion that this was legal uh, some people uh, in the in the academia tend to tend to defend uh, defend uh, their silence by uh, by various factors, especially because they don't have uh, any any you know support or they are afraid of the possible um, uh, possible uh, prosecution uh, that was already mentioned that some. Uh, some uh, new new provisions have been uh, the the Russian law has been amended with the numerous uh, numerous provisions which allow uh, authorities uh, more easily, I think, to prosecute uh, people who expressed uh, various views about uh, uh, Russian military operations, even the legal opinions, um, and. Uh, People justify people justify their silence. People justify uh, 
uh, there in activity, but I don't know anyone, any serious international scholar, any person who knows very well international law, who could ex who express the view that Russia is, uh, is, is, is compliant with the international law, so that Russia bites international law. So I, I don't know such, uh, such uh, individuals. Um, yes, it's indeed, and uh, Putin and Medvedev are formerly uh, persons with legal education, and Medvedev is even former uh, professor of uh, civil law in, uh, in the St. Petersburg State University, but uh, to be honest, uh, they both cannot qualify as, as persons uh, who know international law, and this is not um, and this is not the views that can be uh, can be seen as uh, as as expression of uh, legal views. So, uh, finally, I would like to to say that oh, with regard to to the issues of um, of um, international law. The much uh, much has to be done also to enlighten people, not only in uh, in Russia and Ukraine, but but worldwide. So I think it's our common duty and maybe responsibility um, to to work on that, to explain uh, what what is the nature of the process which are now going in uh, international community. What is the uh, why we have uh, we have such reaction from many states and international organizations? So what what is the international criminal court and what 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 uh, is the court is doing? What is the basis of jurisdiction? People uh, not only in uh, in the countries under I don't know military censorship, but uh, <laughs> worldwide uh, don't know a lot about that. So I think uh, it's uh, will be much more productive if we international lawyers would engage in in uh, with uh, this broader public, this general public, uh, and explain why why we need these rules. That these rules, uh, as many of of today's participants have mentioned, have humanitarian dimension. They are not just abstract uh, principles uh, regulating the the high politics and the international relations, but they are really uh, relevant in the current uh, situation when the people dying every day, when we have uh, blood and disregard to human life and principles that have been developing over the centuries. I don't believe in um, in um, uh, discussion on the, on this uh, these principles because I think what we what we're witnessing today in Ukraine is something where, uh, when we uh, we see the um, uh, actually uh, the violation of the universal universal rules. These rules are universal. There is no uh, ground to to discuss uh, uh, all these uh, nuances that probably would be would be quite appropriate in the peacetime, but not uh, but not now. So thank you very much. Uh, I would be happy also to engage in in the in the conversation today, and um, I thank everybody for attention. Well, thank you very much from our side. Um, it is indeed a rather grim picture you painted here, but um, the end note was a rather, or at least slightly positive one. Um, because in fact, I, I have received questions or comments from friends and students engaged in studying international law, endeavoring a scholarly career or even a practical one in international law, um, who are quite desperate by the situation. And in all these meta discussions we have, um, we saw quite a lot of them today as well. Um, but I, I don't want to talk too much. I know we're already over time a little but I would ask for your patience to still uh, take 10 minutes of uh, questions and answers. Um, I see that we already have a couple of raised hands. So um, uh, to create a safe space for discussion, I will stop the recording now.